Hi, everyone. Welcome back. In this week's lesson, we're going to explore a couple of new different concepts. Uh, in this video in particular, we're going to talk about events and randomness. And then moving on from there, in the other two lessons this week, we're going to explore the concept of loops, and we're going to tie it all together. So let's, uh, let's get started. So let's start with, uh, with events in this video. Um, <clears throat> so as uh, with a lot of sketches, we're going to start by creating here um, a sketch, and we're going to expand the canvas. We're going to use window width and window height to use the space available. Uh, and let's, let's put in a, a black background here, just so it's a little bit easier on the eyes. OK, so let's talk about events. Uh, events in P5 are going to be additional functions that we can define, like setup and draw, that are going to run at a specific time when some event occurs in the program. Uh, there's a handful of those that are available. Um, and uh, let's start with an example uh, using the, uh, the, the window resized event. Okay? So as you can see here, when I, when I resize my window, right? let's say we draw, uh, let's go and draw an ellipse or a circle. Okay, we're going to draw a circle. We're going to center it in the window. And uh, let's set a white stroke and turn off the fill. And our circle is going to be, uh, I don't know, let's say 200 pixel diameter. Here's our circle. So the circle is centered, but you can see that if I if I resize my window, right, this circle is is no longer centered, my preview window. That's because um, window width, right, represents the size of this preview window or the browser window if you're running in full screen mode, whereas a width over here represents the actual size of the created canvas when we call create canvas. So those two concepts are, are connected, but they're not, they don't stay in sync as the program runs. Uh, so if let's say we wanted to respond to this event when the user grabs the side of the window and decides to resize the window that we're playing within, we have access in P5 to a, an event called window resize. Okay? The way we define events is the same syntax as set up and draw. We're going to say function window resized. This function has no parameters, just like set up and draw. And then we use the curly, oops, we use the curly brackets here to define the start and end of the block of code that's going to be uh, window resized. Okay. So um, <clears throat> we can see that uh, this, this function runs, right, whenever we resize the window. Uh, let's say we're going to see, uh, let's put a little console log here. Resize. Okay. So console log allows us to put some text down into the console when something happens. So as soon as I'm going to drag the window, right, we can see that the we've, we've printed this text many times, the, the world resize happens at the bottom here. So this kind of confirms that this is happening one uh, as a specific event. Uh, and that that tech that code didn't run when we just hit play. Um, so let's respond to a window resize. So we're going to use a, a function called resize canvas. And we're going to say when the window gets resized, called resize canvas, and we're going to use window width and window height as the parameters. Okay, so we're not going to create a brand new canvas. We're going to use resize canvas to take the existing one and just change its dimensions. Uh, and now we can see that as I change the size of my window, the circle stays centered. Okay? That's because we've implemented an event. Right? So this event here is responding to something happening. Usually it's going to be some kind of user interaction. So we have uh, an event that responds to window resize. Um, let's take a look at the reference, actually. We'll see there's a few other events that we can play with. So there's a category, he, category here called events. So we, these are basically the different uh, events that we can respond to uh, in P5. So uh, there's, there's some uh, interaction events relating to the keyboard. We're going to get a few examples. Uh, some mouse events, right? So mouse move, drag, press, release, clicked, double clicked. So mouse wheel, you can respond to the mouse wheel. Uh, some touch events, if you're programming something that's meant to be interacted with on a phone or a touch surface. Okay. Um, and then we have things like window resized here. Uh, they're part of the environment um, functions. That's, in fact, that's the only one really that we have to respond with. So not too many events built in, but very useful ones, nonetheless. All right, let's do uh, let's do an example now of a, a mouse event. Okay, so now we have a responding to an event. Okay, um, let's do an example of a mouse event by kind of building on the, the little drawing tool we created in week one. Okay, so by that I mean remember when we moved the background to setup, right? Remember what happened? We said background in P five 
doesn't merely change the background of our sketch. It actually is more like painting over. So when we do this once in the beginning, uh, and then we, let's say, draw a circle here, instead of centering it, we are going to draw using mouse X and mouse Y. Um, what we get is we get this accumulation, right? We're no longer clearing the background at the beginning of every frame. Now, we did that in week one. That was pretty fun, but we are always drawing right now. We don't have the ability to stop drawing. Okay, What if we treated that more like an actual drawing tool so that when I press the mouse uh, and drag, this is when we're going to see some, some drawing happening. And if I'm not pressing the mouse, I'll, I want to be able to move my cursor uh, and just move the cursor without drawing anything. So this is where something like an event can come in handy. So let's, uh, let's respond to a mouse event. So we're going to put in, um, so let's start with mouse pressed as, as our very first one. So what we're going to do is we're going to take the code that we currently have inside draw, which now is happening all the time, regardless of what's going on in the program. And we're going to move that code. We're going to cut it and I'm going to move it down inside the event mouse pressed. Okay. So a mouse event. So now if I hit play, uh, notice that if I move my cursor, nothing happens, right? Draw, draw is now blank. It's empty. So the program is just sitting idle, waiting for us to do something. It will respond to our window resize events. And um, it's no longer erasing the, the background I just noticed. So it might be a good idea to throw in a background in here as well. And it will also wait for us to um, mouse press, right? So now it's on a mouse press event, it's going to draw a circle. Now notice mouse press is defined as me like pressing the mouse, pressing it down, not releasing. So even if I drag, if I drag my mouse around, it's not actually drawing. So we could experiment with this. We could say, let's use a different event. Let's use mouse drag. Okay. So mouse drag is defined as the mouse moving while the button is being pressed. So now if I press and move my mouse, I can kind of use this as a little bit of a, almost like a marker, right? I can actually draw with this now. And I can create not not my best work, but just some interesting compositions. That could be something really fun to play with, by the way. Just kind of experiment with creating your own custom brushes and uh, just manually you know, use them to draw interesting things in the canvas. So nonetheless. So we have events here that allow us to respond to user input. Um, let's do a quick example of a keyboard event. So we're going to a keyboard event. Okay. So every time we want to respond to a different event, what we need to do is we need to just implement that function. So we're going to go in and say, okay, function. Now uh, let's define the key pressed event. So this code is going to run anytime I press a key on my keyboard. Okay. So what would we want to do on key pressed? Well, maybe we're going to use the keyboard to, uh, to, to erase the drawing, right? So if we want to erase the drawing, we're going to call background. I'm going to call background here and uh, let's test this out. Um, so now I can draw, you know, I can draw something with my drawing tool. And if I press a key, I can erase it. Right? So now we have this interesting flow to our program that we didn't have before. We have setup, which runs once in the beginning. We have draw, which is going to be stuff that's going to happen continuously, regardless of what's happening. And then we have a few events. These events are code that are just on standby and are going to get called upon whenever that event occurs. So now we have this much more interesting flow to our program and we can insert different things based on, on user interaction. Okay. Cool. <clears throat> now within an event, we can also get a little bit more specific. Um, so for example, right now, if I press any key, it's always going to erase the background. Okay. So we could say, uh, let's say we're only going to erase the background if the key that was pressed. So we have access to this global variable called key. Key always contains the last key that was pressed on the keyboard. So we'll say if this is equal to the letter B, then we're going to open our curly brackets and we're going to erase the background. So we saw in last week's lesson, we talked about conditionals, right? Conditionals allow us to ask a question when the program runs ask a question and based on the answer to that question, if it's true or false, the code inside the if is going to run or not. So here we're comparing the value of key with the character B and using double equal to do this comparison. Okay, double equal in P5 means or JavaScript means a comparison if the, if the two values are equal. So let's run this. So now uh, if I draw 
you know, if I draw a shape here, and um, if I press random keys on my keyboard, it doesn't get erased uh, only, only if I press the B key. Okay, so we can respond to specific keys inside this, uh, this key pressed event. All right. Um, now, one thing I'm going to point out here is that um, as we add more functions to our code, we can see now the code is starting to look a lot more uh, complicated. And we have all of these really important curly open and close curly brackets, right, that define individual sections of code. We have to be really careful with these. Uh, make sure we don't, you know, accidentally, you know, define a function like this, right, and then include it inside another one. You know, that would be really bad. Like the code is not going to run now and it's not going to work. Uh, and in fact, this is so bad that it's like not even giving me an error. It's just not doing what's expected. Um, which is kind of surprising. So <clears throat> in a way to kind of help um, protect against this and just make the, the program a little bit more readable, one thing that I like to do, and again, this is not part of the syntax, this is something that I like to do is uh, use a comment and then make some kind of a of line, right? So I like to use single dash or you could, or you could just lean on the comments and just make a line like this. And I like to make these comments to separate uh, the different functions in my program. Okay, so this is purely something I like to do that I'm sharing with you. Uh, and by doing so now, it's a little bit easier as you scroll through to see which, like where the sections begin and end, because now you've got these lines between them. So just a little tip here, that uh, something you might want to consider in your own code. Okay. <clears throat> All right, now in this lesson, now that we've talked about events, uh, and we'll do more examples uh, along the you know, throughout the course of events, um, I want to talk a little bit about randomness, uh, just to make this lesson a little bit more interesting. And we're going to use that concept in the next two as well. Um, so randomness is P5 and P5 is basically this idea that we can define a variable. And instead of having a, a fixed value, like for example, uh, let's say we made the, the diameter of our circle a variable. We saw last week that the way we can do this is we can say define a variable, let's call it diameter. Right, we'll give it a value of 200, and then we'll put in diameter as the parameter. Okay, so we have we can do something like this. Uh, so now I've defined it as a variable, and its value is fixed. Okay, I could say let's make this a you know I could make this a global variable, right? If I made it a global variable, this is a little bit of review. Um, I could make it so that maybe it starts out small starts out small, and then over time, maybe every time I drag the mouse, uh, maybe this diameter increases, right? So now I have a quantity that I can manipulate and change. So this could start small, and the more I draw, the bigger this, um, this diameter gets, okay? So we could do that. Now I'm gonna bring it, this back as a, as a local variable here, just to demonstrate the concept of randomness. So with random in P5, we can say, instead of setting this variable to a fixed value, we're going to basically roll roll a dice and set this variable to a random value every time. And the way we do this is we use the random function. Okay. Now, if we just say random by itself, it will give us a number between zero and one. Okay. So if I run this here, you can see that we're getting diameters between zero and one. Some of them are very tiny, so they appear to be smaller than because they're less than one. Okay. So this is not very helpful. So the random function, we can also provide it a parameter, which is going to define, uh, give me instead of a number between zero and one, give me a number between zero and whatever number we put in as a parameter. So let's say I put in 200. Now this random function is going to give me numbers randomly between zero and 200. So let's test this out as we draw. Okay. So now as I draw, we can see that it's drawing a circle, but it's randomizing its diameter. <clears throat> okay. Now we can go further than this. We can even also say instead of a p random number between zero and 200, let's specify um, a range perhaps. Maybe we don't want to get a circle that has zero. We want to only get numbers between 100 and 200. So random will oblige. And every time this code is going to run, right, the random number generator is going to spit out a value, right? So this function here is going to spit out a number and it's going to assign it to the value of that, of that variable because we put it on the right side of the equal sign. So we can also specify a range. 
So now we don't get those tiny little circles. Uh, we're only getting values between uh, 100 and 200, or you know, we could vary it even less if we wanted to. So now there's some variation, but it's much more subtle. There's only a range of, it can only go between 100 and 120, let's say. All right. Uh, so we can use random to kind of spit out random values and then just make our program a little bit more unpredictable that way. Um, <clears throat> and we can use random as many times as we want, right? We can plug in random numbers in different places. Uh, for example, let's say um, we would change the, the fill color of this circle, right? Let's make it a random color. So an easy way to do this is we're going to use, uh, we are going to use the, um, the color mode hue, saturation, and brightness, or HSB. Okay, so I'm going to go to setup. I'm going to just do this once in the beginning. Uh, we're going to switch to color mode HSB, which stands for hue, saturation, brightness, um, saturation. The reason I like to do this to make random colors is that uh, if you try to make a random RGB color, you're going to randomize the red, the green, and the blue. You're going to end up with some pretty ugly colors uh, a lot of the time. Whereas if you play in hue saturation brightness mode, let's say we wanted to get bright, you know, saturated colors, but just randomize their hue. Um, we can do this more easily. We'll just have one single number to randomize the hue, which is where you are on the color wheel. And then we can control the saturation and brightness separately. Okay. So let's do that. We're going to say instead of setting a white stroke here, we're going to set, um, we're going to set no stroke. And let's define some some variables for our um, our color. So I'm going to use H here as a shorthand for hue because there's already a, something called a function called hue in the language. So I'm going to try not to use keywords that are already part of P5. So for the hue, we're going to generate a random number between 0 and 360 because 360 is the maximum number we can have for the hue. It's basically going around the color circle. Okay? Then for the saturation, we're going to make it equal to 255. And the brightness, we're going to make it equal to 255. And let's put a little comment here so we re remember what these uh, shorthand letters mean. Okay? Uh, and then we're going to use these variables to, uh, to set the hue, saturation, and brightness of our fill color. Okay, let's see what that looks like. Cool. So now we're getting brightly colored, uh, randomly generated circles every time we draw the mouse curve. We draw the, drag the mouse across the canvas. Uh, maybe even for fun, we're going to make these uh, semi-transparent just to, so we can see underneath a little bit. Nice. Okay. <clears throat> Um, now, this doesn't also have to be uh, following the mouse, right? Remember, we can randomize any value that you want. So imagine for a second here, um, let's say we didn't want to follow the mouse. Maybe we just wanted to make it so that uh, every time we press the mouse, okay, let's say we press the mouse. Um, so every time we click, right, instead of drawing a circle where a cursor is, we'd just like to see a circle in some random position on the screen, right? Just a random one that appears on the screen. So we could randomize that too, right? Let's make a variable here. Let's call it X. We're going to say X is going to be equal to a random number. And we're going to use width, right, as the limit for our random number. So we can go anywhere between zero and width. And then for Y, we'll do the same. And then so that gives us a, a coordinate now that we can use for our circle. Right? We're going to use it as a coordinate here. And now every time I press, I'm going to get a randomly generated circle at a, at a random location, a random diameter, and a random color. All right. <clears throat> okay, so we're going to leave it at that um, for this video. We're going to actually build on the next one, uh, starting from here. And we're going to talk about, okay, now that we know how to do this, right, it would be kind of interesting if instead of every time I click, right, if we, because right now it takes a lot of clicking to sort of get the, the screen to fill up. It would be nice if every time I click, um, I was able to not just draw one circle, but maybe draw like 10 at a time, 20 at a time, 15 at a time. And we're going to explore the concept of loops in order to help us do this. Okay. So um, we're going to leave it at, there, at that for this video, and I'll see you in the next one.